Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to today's edition of Spectral Geometry in the Clouds. Uh, today it is our pleasure to listen to Mustafa Sabri from uh, New York University uh, of Abu Dhabi. Uh, and he's going to tell us about quantum ergodicity on periodic graphs. As usual, don't hesitate to ask questions by unmuting yourself or sending them in the chat. We will uh, tell them to the speaker. Uh, Mustafa, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much for the invitation. So yeah, today I, today I will speak about quantum ergodicity on periodic graphs. So um, it's, uh, it's a result of uh, delocalization. So um, yeah, so thanks again for the invitation. So I was saying that um, uh, I, I may be talking about delocalization. So first uh, I'll give you quickly what uh, we mean generally by delocalization. And uh, then I'll move uh, more precisely to the topic of today, which is uh, periodic graphs. So there are these are quite nice uh, graphs. We, we already have uh, some uh, general results, uh, in particular the Bloch theorem. And I'll discuss it and discuss some limitations, and then I'll give you our main results and hopefully, uh, if we have time, so, some ideas of the proof. Okay, so first, uh, deloc by delocalization in general, there are uh, several interpretations. So suppose you are given a Schrodinger operator H and a certain interval in the spectrum, then uh, you can understand delocalization from three points of view. So from a spectral point of view, uh, you say your, op your operator is delocalized if the spectrum of the operator in I is purely absolutely continuous. So that's a spectral criterion. From a dynamical point of view, you want uh, the wave packet, uh, which have energies in I, to spread on the lattice as time goes on. So let me give you an example. Suppose that you work on Z, on the line Z, and you start with uh, delta zero. Okay, so just MS at zero, uh, just MS one and zero, and the rest. Uh, and then you, you evolve the state using the, the Schrodinger semigroup E power ith. So you study E power ith delta zero, and you want that this function, which was concentrated on zero, as time goes on, it starts to spread out over Z. Okay. So already from the spectrum, you can see that it will escape any compact set, but you can ask a more precise question. Uh, how fast does it spread out? And uh, as it spread out, does it flatten uh, or does it just move? Okay. So these are dynamical questions. As you can see, they depend on them. So the first question was about purely spectral uh, question, the second one about the dynamics. The third one is about the states. Okay. So you can ask uh, here uh, by state, I, mean, I just mean an eigenvector, really. So, uh, uh, if I take an eigenvector in I, uh, is it supported on, on a small region or a, or a large region and so on? So if I am in the AC spectrum, of course, I don't have really eigenvector, but maybe I can approximate my infinite model using a finite model and study the eigenvector on the finite model and so on. So uh, what would be the opposite of having uh, an eigenvector localized in a small region is ideally to have it somehow uniformly distributed like uh, a sine wave or something like that. So it is uh, precisely the third question that we will uh, be concerned with. And I'll, I'll, I'll say more precisely what we want to prove uh, using some simple examples. Uh, and uh, what, what we will prove is a quantum ergodicity theorem. So traditionally quantum ergodicity was uh, for, for manifolds first. So roughly speaking, it says the following. Uh, if you know that the classical particles motion on a compact manifold is ergodic, so in some sense, it visits all the manifold because the ergodic, the ergodic theorem tells us that if we integrate over a trajectory, it's like integrating over the whole space with a uniform measure. Okay, so in some sense, the classical particle visits all the manifold, then you have a quantum analog of this property, which is exactly quantum ergodicity, namely uh, the Laplacian wave functions will be equally likely to be anywhere on the manifold. More precisely, the probability measure given by psi square approaches the uniform measure. Okay, and this holds when the, the energy becomes very large. Okay, and there, it's just roughly speaking, the, the theorem is more precise than this. 
but uh, I'm sure most uh, most people here already know the theorem. So let us move on. Um, so today there will be no manifold, just uh, just graphs, and uh, it will be a different um, limit, but similar uh, similar idea. So okay, let, let me uh, start with uh, the the framework. So throughout this talk, uh, I will, gamma will be a graph which is connected locally finite in some Euclidean space. And the main assumption is the following. I assume that it is invariant under translations uh, of some linearly independent vector A1 to AD. Okay, so you can view this as, a, as the basis of ZD. So in particular, the vertex set of my graph will be will take the following form it is a there will be a finite set vf which you can understand as some kind of fundamental uh, as a vertex set of some fundamental graph which you then translate it uh, using zd okay so you have so, some shape that you keep uh, copying under the action of z uh, if you are in one dimension or z2 and so on so for example if my graph is ZD itself, then my VF here is just the, the vertex zero, which I'm translating using the standard basis. Okay, so integer, uh, integer multiples of the standard basis, like this, I, I had all ZD. Okay, so here VF is just zero. Another example, you can have something like this uh, ladder graph. So in this case, your fundamental set is these two vertices. Okay, this is the two path, P2. Okay, and I'm translated it in one direction. Okay, so here uh, A1 is just, again, uh, just one direction, and this is Z periodic. Okay, and so on. So for example, I can have something like this. So in this case, I have this uh, fundamental uh, graph here, which I'm just copying over Z2. This is how you should imagine the thing. So in general, uh, the graphs that we are talking about today are really graphs of this type. I have some periodic, uh, some, some motif that I keep uh, copying over Z2. Uh, I will also add uh, a, a potential. So we endow gamma with a periodic potential uh, satisfies Q of V plus AI equal Q of V. So this means that uh, I will put a certain values of the potential here, and then I copy them. So here, uh, if here is Q1, then this will also be Q1, this will also be Q1, and so on. Okay, so you only, if the fundamental cell has uh, new values, okay, if new is the number of vertices, then the distinct values of the potential are at most new, okay, which are the ones here, and then I just copy them. So this way, H becomes uh, a Schrodinger operator. So A here is the adjacency matrix of the infinite graph, okay? And this is the periodic potential. So the question we are interested in is uh, the delocalization properties of the eigenvectors of H. Okay, so typically uh, we know already that uh, the, these operators have absolutely continuous spectrum. So more precisely, I will not study the eigenvectors of H itself, but of uh, on a finite uh, region. Okay, so I approximate gamma with a finite subgraph gamma n, which is uh, just uh, n power d copies of my cell. Okay, so the, the size of gamma n is just nu, which is the number of vertices in the fundamental set times n power d. And we, we, we use uh, periodic conditions. Okay, so, and I study the eigenvectors of Hm on this gamma n, and I, I take the limit when n grows large. Okay, so I try to understand how the eigenvector look on gamma n when n becomes very large. Uh, let, let us start with very, a very, very simple example. So uh, just gamma equals z. Okay, I take the adjacency matrix on Z. In this case, uh, take gamma N with periodic conditions means that you are working on an N cycle. Good. So my, my adjacency matrix is, as you know, if uh, A F of J will be F of J minus one plus F of J plus one, just the sum over nearest neighbors. 
Now for this uh, matrix, everything is computable. So if you if you want to ask about the eigenvectors, you can compute them explicitly and see how they behave. So uh, for this uh, adjacency matrix, uh, we can find this basis of eigenvectors. So uh, it, uh, it is very ideal for, from the point of view of the localization, as I will tell you. So here uh, I have just one omega j. So the omega are roots of unity. Yeah? So I have just the vertex one, and then I multiply it by a phase, multiply it by another phase, and so on. Uh, you can check that this is indeed an eigenvector. It's very simple computation with uh, the uh, eigenvalue, this one, okay? And uh, in general, this is because uh, this is a circulant matrix. So uh, any circulant matrix has a basis of eigenvectors like this. Okay, maybe the eigenvalue will be more complicated, but. Okay, so let us study these eigenvectors a bit uh, uh, in more detail. So, First of all, they, they are perfectly uniformly distributed. So when I talk about uniform distribution, I always look at modulus of psi square. So if I look at, for any eigenfunction psi g, if I look at, at psi g of k square, it is everywhere one over n because omega is just the root of unity. Okay, so if I look at the modulus at any entry, it is one over n, it is perfectly uniformly distributed. Okay, this is in sharp contrast to a situation of localization in which typically uh, your vectors are just in on one supported on one vertex on two vertex. Now here it's really ideal, and these are all the eigenfunctions in this basis are perfectly distributed. Then there are other criteria for uh, deloc for delocalization. So, for example, the supremum norm decays very fast, like one over root n. This is the fastest it can decay, and this already uh, is is already an indication of delocalization. Uh, it implies that the, su the support is large. Okay, so if you have a, a good bound on the supremum norm, you can say something that the support is, is large. Uh, the p norm is also interesting in, in this uh, study. It, it gives you some more precise information about the shape of the eigenvector. Uh, so it, it's a bit finer than the supremum norm. But anyway, as you can see, uh, these eigenvectors are really ideal for what we can hope uh, of delocalization. They're perfectly uniformly distributed, they have a very large support. In fact, the support is a whole graph. and. Uh, their supreme norm decay very fast. Okay, uh, this was on Z, right? Let us uh, move to ZD. So on ZD, we can also find a basis of eigenvectors, which is very nice. So actually it's exactly the same basis. I will just take the exponentials, uh, the properly normalized. Then these, eigen these are also eigenvectors. They form a basis on the cube of side length n with this eigenvalue. And again, you see they are perfectly uniformly distributed because again, this modulus is just one. So you have the, the, the eigenfunction, any eigenfunction in this basis gives weight exactly one over nd, which is one over the volume over all vertices. Okay, so on zd in general, uh, we see that we can, al we can always find uh, an orthonormal basis, which is perfect, perfectly delocalized. And this is a general fact on periodic graph. So on any periodic graph, you can find eigenfunction like this. And this is the Bloch theorem. So it is not exactly uniformly distributed, but something very close. So what the Bloch theorem tells you is the following. If I have, uh, if H is a periodic Schrodinger operator over gamma, which is a periodic graph, then for any, eigen, uh, for any eigenvalue in the spectrum, I can always find an eigenfunction psi lambda. So here gamma is the infinite graph. So psi lambda will not be square summable, but it is just a, a solution to the eigenvalue problem, which satisfies the following. So this is the important thing. Psi lambda of Ka plus Vn uh, is equal to just a, a multiple phase of some fixed function little f. Okay, so let me explain this on the picture. So the Bloch theorem tells you that for any eigen, for any energy in the spectrum, you can find a Bloch eigenfunction, which uh, which is the following: 
you take a, a certain, it, it is a certain function little f here. And then its value in this block is just a, a multiple, a phase multiple of its value here. So if, for example, here I was one, here I will be uh, e power i theta. If here I was two, here I will be two e power i theta. Okay, so I just take the values here. I multiply them by a certain phase. And here I, I multiply them by a different phase. I multiply, but in, in general, the, the, the values of the block function are, that, are just one function f, which you will then multiply by phases. So in particular, when you study the square modulus, it is exactly the same because the phase disappear. So the square modulus distribution here is the same as the distribution here. It's, it, it becomes a periodic function, okay? So maybe within the cell, the, the function is, uh, has different masses. For example, here it has a value, here it has a different value, but as you translate the function, okay, the, the values just repeat themselves in the square modulus, okay? So, so this is on the infinite graph and you can also do it on, the, uh, on, on gamma n. So you can also find a block eigenfunction. And uh, in this case, uh, the theta, you can take it rational like, uh, like the case of Z, okay, G over N. Good, so as I, as I was saying, this implies that this block eigenfunction is very, is, ve is very good from a point of view of delocalization. It is a periodic function. Okay, it is not exactly one over the volume over each in each vertex, but it is a periodic function. So, and that's uh, what, what uh, the best we can hope for. Okay, so it, not not perfectly flat, but somehow uh, periodic. Um, now, what we would like to investigate in this talk is uh, whether such a delocalization holds for any eigenbasis. So, already in case of ZD you can see that there is a, a lot of multiplicity. Okay, so here, here I showed you a, a very good eigenbasis, but maybe you can ask uh, what about different eigenbasis? Do, do they behave as well as this one or not? Okay, so we, here we are interested really to try to understand delocalization, but for all eigenbasis. Uh, so and as an example to motivate the following, let, let me give you some limitations of this Bloch theorem that I explained. So consider the, the following graph. I take uh, just Z and decorate it by a triangle. So I attach triangle at, at each vertex. Then you see that uh, actually for this graph, there are localized eigenfunctions. Okay, so for, for us, they are very bad. So as you can see, they are supported on only two vertices and the rest is zero. Okay, so you can, you can check that uh, this is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue minus one, right? If I take uh, one plus zero, it gives me one, which is minus this one, okay? And here, of course, uh, zero everywhere. Okay, so I have a, an eigenfunction with eigenvalue one on this periodic graph, which is very, very localized. Okay, it's, it's the complete opposite of what we, what we are saying. We, we are saying, we were saying that we want something equidistributed. Here is just localized on two vertices and the, the rest zero. So for us, this is very bad, and this does not contradict the Bloch theorem, because uh, I could, instead of having this function, I could take this, this distribution here and multiply it by a phase here, and multiply it by another phase here, and so on. So in this case, I get a Bloch eigenfunction, okay, for the same eigenvalue minus one, but this do doesn't imply that there are other eigenvalues which are very bad. Uh, other eigenfunctions which are very bad for the same energy. Uh, let me give you another example. So th this process here is general. It, uh, you, you take any graph and attach co copies of a finite graph at, at each vertex. It's called the graph decoration. And maybe it's not very surprising that you can construct a localized eigenfunction in this manner. But what was more surprising to me is this graph. Okay, so this graph is really very, very beautiful. I mean, it's just uh, perfectly regular. Uh, all, like, all vertices look the same, and yet um, you have very localized eigenfunction. Okay, so again, I have an eigenfunction living on just two vertices. Again, this does not contradict the Bloch theorem because instead of this eigenfunction, I could take these two values, multiply them here by a phase, here by another phase, here by another phase. In this case, I have a delocalized function. But the problem is that 
there are other and and it's actually here the problem is really significant because here I have this function, but I could so this is one function. I could take another localized function by putting one and minus one here and the rest zero, and then another function here. So you see that as the as the graph grows infinite, this eigenvalue becomes infinitely degenerate. Okay, so it's it's very bad. Uh, for a perfectly good uh, graph, I mean, I could not, uh, I, I really don't, uh, maybe I can comment on this graph later uh, if I have time, but but I mean, it really lo looks nice. So there is still one thing here you could argue in both examples, uh, there is a flat band. Okay, so there is, uh, so uh, there is an infinitely degenerate eigenvalue. And you could argue maybe that's the problem. Maybe if the spectrum is absolutely continuous, then all all functions all functions are block functions. Okay, I don't have this problem in Europe. So maybe you could conjecture. Okay, maybe block theorem applies to all eigenfunction if the spectrum is purely absolutely continuous. And actually, that's not exactly true. Already on Z, it's not true. So uh, if I am on Z, I take just the adjacency matrix on Z. And I approximate Z by uh, the a cycle of with uh, four n vertices. Then I have this eigenfunction here. Okay, so you can check that this is an eigenfunction with. Uh, so I just take zero, one, zero, minus one, and repeat. Okay, uh, you can check that this is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue zero. But when you look at the square modulus of the entries, here it's zero. Here is one over two n, zero, one over two n, etc. Okay, so if it was a block function, the, the fundamental cell here is just uh, one digit. Okay, so if it was a block function, these are exactly the block function are the one that I, I, I put here. Okay, here I have one, and then I multiply by a field, I multiply by a field. This is exactly the block eigenfunction. Okay, but the one here is not a block eigenfunction. Okay, because it is one over two n and then zero. Then okay, so you do not just translate the masses. You so already on on Z you cannot say that uh, that all eigenfunctions are block eigenfunction. It's it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, <clears throat> but our aim is to show that when the spectrum is absolutely continuous, then not all eigenfunctions are block functions, but somehow most eigenfunctions have some kind of uniform distribution or periodicity. Okay. So you could say in some sense, uh, roughly speaking, but very roughly speaking, uh, most eigenfunctions will behave like block eigenfunction, but not, not really. I mean, it's, it's weaker than this. But. So in other words, under some assumptions, uh, in any eigenbasis, there won't be many functions like psi zero. This psi zero, most of them will be somehow uniformly distributed. Okay, but we, we already see that we cannot say all of them because this is not equidistant. Okay, so after this long introduction, maybe I can give you our first uh, main result. Uh, so uh, consider a periodic graph gamma. And again, I, I remind you, I denote by mu the number of vertices in the fundamental cell. Our first theorem, we assume that nu is just one. So my fundamental cell, uh, my fundamental domain is just one vertex that we translate. Okay, only one. For these graphs, we, we have a very good result. So for if you give me any eigenbasis and any observable an, so observable is just a function on gamma n. Okay, any function you want, our only assumption uh, is that it is uniformly bounded by one. Okay, so we, uh, you, you, an can change with n, okay, but uh, we only assume that it is bounded by one. Then we, we know that this limit goes to zero. Okay, so what does it mean? As you can see, this is a Cesaro sum. So the fact that this limit goes to zero implies using, using Barkov inequality that for the majority of, of U, this scalar product is very close to this average here. Okay, so what is this scalar product? Here I'm just averaging A over the, uh, the modulus of psi square. Okay, so this is a probability measure given by psi square. And I'm comparing it with the average of A over the uniform measure. And I'm telling you that for any observable, for most eigenfunctions, these two will be close. Well, there is a little caveat is that um, 
be careful that the most eigenfunction will depend on the observable for, for each A, there are a good set of functions, but uh, still. Uh, so, so we would like to say that very weakly, uh, somehow this implies that the probability measure given by modulus of psi square is close to the uniform measure. Okay, so in some sense, in some very weak sense, uh, modulus of psi of e square is approximately uniformly distributed for most eigenfunctions. Okay, so let me, uh, there is an important assumption here is that the fundamental cell is just one vertex. So let me give you some examples. And if there is any question, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. So uh, the first example is of course, uh, just the integer lattice. So you take the adjacency matrix on ZD. You can also make some variations. So for example, I take Z and I add uh, some links, uh, not just between nearest neighbor, but between neighbor of size two, uh, et cetera. So in this case, you, you can see, for example, in ZD, I'm, ju I'm just, uh, my fundamental set is just one vertex and I keep translating it over ZD. Here, my fundamental set is again, just one vertex. Uh, also the triangular lattice, okay. This is again, uh, uh, you could also consider the King's graph. Okay, so King because uh, that's exactly how the King moves on the chess. Uh, so on all these graphs, if you consider, uh, if you give me any eigenbasis of the adjacency matrix, I can tell you that somehow weakly, most eigenfunctions are equidistributed. Uh, but still, uh, we, we would like to, goof, uh, to, to do a bit uh, a bit more because you see when, when I assume that my fundamental set has only one vertex, then already I'm excluding potential because I told you that the potential only varies within the fundamental set. Okay, so here in this case, the, the potential is thus constant. So this is really a theorem about adjacency matrices. It is not about periodic Schrodinger because there is only one, the, the fundamental domain is just one set. But still, I mean, uh, not bad, and, and also it uh, is good to have uh, really the uniform uh, measure. Uh, we would like to go further, so le let us treat uh, the case of general mu. Now I take a, a general fundamental domain. Uh, from the counter examples that I gave you, uh, we see that we must make some assumptions because uh, for example here, my fundamental domain has two vertices and we see that uh, quantum ergodicity is violated. Okay, the, these very localized eigenfunction uh, uh, violate uh, quantum ergodicity. You can show that uh, this theorem will not be true. Okay, so we need some assumptions. Uh, and uh, we should at least uh, exclude point spectrum. Okay, so that was uh, our goal initially. Suppose that I have a general fundamental domain but I have no point spectrum. Do we have quantum ergodicity? So unfortunately we have a, a bit stronger assumption than just AC spectrum. So our assumption is in terms of uh, Floquet eigenvalues. So let me just quickly tell you what this is about. Uh, you see, if you have a periodic graph like this one, an infinite periodic graph, you can hope that somehow you can understand the, the theory of the, the Schrodinger operator of, on the infinite periodic graph by understanding what happens on the fundamental domain. And it will not just be one Schrodinger operator, but somehow a family of Schrodinger operator H of theta. Okay, so that, that's exactly the spirit of the Floquet decomposition. So roughly speaking, it, it goes as follows. The set of uh, the, the L2 function on the whole graph gamma, you can understand them as being some kind of direct integral of L2 function on the fundamental domain. And your Schrodinger operator H becomes a direct integral of Schrodinger operators H of theta and H of theta now operates on the fundamental set, which so, so because the fundamental cell just has new vertices here, the H of theta is just a new by new matrix. Okay, so what I'm saying is that I've reduced somehow the study of H uh, over all over the infinite graph uh, gamma by studying a family H of theta on just one uh, uh, one fundamental block. 
Okay, so now uh, these are just new by new matrices, which depend on a parameter seed. And the operator is actually somehow explicit. Uh, so this is H of theta. It's, it's uh, somehow a, a weighted adjacency matrix plus uh, your potential. Uh, I did not explain what is this uh, floor function and fractional function. It's not important for this talk, but uh, what's important is somehow it depends on theta in, in some hopefully nice manner. Okay, so for each fixed theta, here theta uh, is uh, varies continuously over uh, over the dual torus. Okay, so for each theta, you have an operator h of theta, and you, uh, because h of theta is a new by new matrix, it has new eigenvalues uh, e s of theta. Okay, so suppose I want to. Yeah, is there a question? Or... So if I draw them on the real line. Uh, I will have for each theta, I will have new values. Okay, so here, for example, I have uh, I have drawn the case of Z with a potential taking only two values, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, et cetera. Okay, so in this case, my fundamental block has two vertices. So the fundamental matrix somehow will be a two by two matrix with two eigenvalues. So for each theta, I have two eigenvalues. So if you draw them on the plane, there are just two points. But as theta varies, each eigenvalue will draw a band. Okay, so here for fixed theta, I have a point. But as theta varies from zero to one, I draw this band. Okay, and, and so this is the positive root and the negative root will draw this band. Okay, and the spectrum of the infinite operator is exactly the union of these two bands. Okay, so the spectrum of H in general will be um, the image of ES, uh, the union of the image of ES uh, of uh, the dual tools. Uh, now, let me, uh, with this introduction, let me now give you our second main result. So uh, I will denote by LN the, just the set of uh, integers from zero to N minus one. Then for any new now, the fundamental domain can be as large as you want, and you can put uh, periodic potential, no problem. We have a certain assumption on the flow K eigenvalues. Okay, these eigenvalues that I explained here. Okay, and I will I will uh, tell you what this assumption means. Under certain assumption, we have quantum ergodicity. Okay, M meaning that this Cesaro uh, Cesaro average goes to zero. And you, you see that now the theorem is not exactly like the, the previous one. So here again, I can, I can uh, deduce that for most eigenfunctions, this scalar product will be close to this, but this is no longer the uniform average. Okay, it is uh, something uh, strange, uh, but the, this operator is somehow explicit, but in one case, it, it is nice. So if, instead of taking any observable E, I take it to be locally constant. So locally constant means that it takes just one value in each periodic block. So for example, here the periodic block, is, uh, I mean, uh, this is trivial. Here, for example, the periodic block has two vertices. So I want my, my observable to have just one value here, maybe a different value here maybe a different value, okay? So I don't want it to change within the block, okay? That's what I mean by locally constant. So for, in the special case of locally constant, uh, sorry, in the special case of locally constant observable, this mysterious uh, thing is the uniform average. Okay, so in this case, for locally constant observable, this scalar product is close to the uniform average. What does this mean? It means that, the model of size square does not favor any periodic block. Okay, so maybe uh, if we go back, for example, to, to this, uh, this picture here. So the, essentially what the theorem tells you is that uh, size square uh, here, the mass distribution of size square here will be the same as the mass distribution here, will be the same as the mass distribution here and so on. Okay, maybe within the block size square 
is not uniform. And this already we, we expected from already when discussing block theory, okay? So maybe within the block, the, you, you do not really understand what happens, but as you move from one block to another, uh, everything is the same, okay? So in this sense, it is a periodic function. Okay, so very roughly speaking, you can say that under this uh, mysterious uh, assumption that I have not explained yet, uh, most eigenfunctions behave like Bloch eigenfunction, but not really. I mean, uh, what we are saying is really much less precise than this, but somehow uh, you can understand it like this. Okay, is it clear so far? So uh, be before, uh, before I explain this assumption, let me give you just uh, quick applications. Uh, so for example, it, it applies to the adjacency matrix on the honeycomb lattice. Here, as you can see, the, the fundamental domain has two vertices. So it is not covered by the first theorem. Uh, we can also show that it applies to periodic Schrodinger operator on Z. Okay, so here I took Z, I put uh, four values of potential and then I repeat them. Then for these examples, we can check uh, this, this assumption. Okay, so let me now explain what this assumption means. As you can see here, my, I have a certain theta, okay? And here I have a different theta, okay? So, and I have a, a certain eigenvalue function ES and EW, and I don't want them to meet too often, okay? So the number of R such as this equals to this should not be uh, very significant. Okay, what does it mean? Let me give you example. Uh, suppose that you are in one dimension, okay? And let us see how this eigenvalue function behave as theta moves. As theta moves, okay, you start from zero. Then for theta equals zero, you are here. And as you move, you trace the band like this. Do, do you see me moving the mouse? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, great. Similarly, the other band, you when you trace it, you go like this, and that's it, okay? Now, uh, if you have the adjacency matrix on Z, so without potential, you, uh, your eigenvalue function is just uh, two cosine two pi theta. So as you move, uh, as you cover the interval minus two, two, you move like this. So you start from two until minus two, and then you go once back and that's it, okay? This is nice. Now, what could go wrong is the following. Suppose that when tracing this band, my eigenvalue function behaves as follows. I first goes from right to left, and then I go back, and then I go back again, and then I go back. This is for us, this is very bad, okay? So if you have twice the movement in the same direction when tracing the band, you have a problem. Also, for example, we don't want the eigenvalue function to hesitate somehow. So maybe the eigenvalue function behaves like this. You, you go from right to the middle, and then you go back, and then you go forward again. Okay, so this back and forth, okay, we don't want to, well, we don't want it to happen too often. So uh, if you are in one dimension, for example, we do not want something like cosine four pi theta. Already four pi theta means that you go back and forth twice. Okay, in higher dimension, you can see that this back and forth is is necessary. Okay, we, you must do that. But what we want is that compared to ND, we, we don't want it to, to be, uh, to, I mean, we don't want this to, to happen too much. Okay, so roughly speaking, the set of theta that satisfy this should be of lower dimension, not the whole space. Okay, so uh, essentially I would like to say that this is a zero set of some analytic function. So somehow this is D minus one dimensional. So compared to ND, this should go to zero, but it's not as simple as this. Okay, so it's, uh, as you can see, it's not just that the eigenfunction, eigenvalue function is analytic, you, you need something more precise than this. Okay, roughly speaking, we don't want short, uh, short period. That's uh, the spirit of, of this assumption. Um, <clears throat> okay, so is it clear somehow? Um, so we spent some time trying to prove that, uh, you see, if you have point spectrum, this assumption is violated because uh, in this case, if you take just ES, so take S equal W, then ES is a constant function. Okay, so the left-hand side is trivial. Okay, so in case you have point spectrum, you, this, this is violated. Okay, so this assumption implies that you have no point spectrum. 
And we spent some time trying to prove that uh, actually, uh, if you are purely absolutely continuous, then this is always satisfied. Uh, but it turned out that this is not correct. So there are counter examples. We constructed one. So there exists a connected periodic graph with pure absolutely continuous spectrum, which do not satisfy this Floquet assumption. Uh, to construct our counter example, we use tensor products. So here, uh, just for illustration, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the tensor product of Z with P2. P2 is a two path. So the way you construct a tensor product, you first, uh, for P2, you just take two copies of Z and then you draw edges using this rule. So U uh, moves in this direction, V in this direction. So you want both to move. You want U, uh, this will be adjacent to this. If U is adjacent to U prime, and V is adjacent to, okay, so U adjacent to U prime means that I must move left or right to draw an edge. And if I'm up, then I must go down to, to V prime. Okay, so that's why I have this uh, two edge and so on. So uh, this graph here is not nice because it, it is not connected. Okay, it is disconnected. I do not have vertices in the middle. Okay, so of course, quantum ergodicity will not be satisfied. So we need a, a more careful choice of GF. So we do not take the two paths, we, we, but for example, we can take one of these graphs. So if you, if you take the tensor product of Z with one of these graphs, it will not satisfy this mysterious assumption. More precisely, what happens is the following, is that you have one eigenvalue function that goes like this, like this, and, the, and another eigenvalue function, it goes in the opposite direction goes like this, like this. And these two eigenfunctions going in the opposite direction create a problem for us. So we do not have a counterexample when S is equal to W. Our counterexample uses, really uses that S, S is distinct from W. And wh what I didn't say is that if you, if you are only concerned with locally constant observable, you only need the assumption for S equal to W. Okay, so in this, framework, we do not have a counter example. So maybe uh, AC spectrum is sufficient if you only care about locally constant observable, but we do not have a proof. I'm uh, just saying maybe. Okay, uh, there is an important open problem, of course, is that uh, I, I showed you that we can, set a, we can check the assumption for, uh, for periodic potential on Z, but what about ZD with D high greater than one? Uh, we cannot, I mean, we tried, but we, we couldn't. So this is an open problem. Very, so very classical operator, periodic Schrodinger operator on ZD. Do the Floquet uh, eigenvalue behave well in terms of uh, this move, motion? And uh, I managed to convince uh, Wen Tsai Liu that uh, this is an interesting problem. So he is, <laughs> he is looking at it. He's a specialist of these kinds of periodic operators. So I hope, uh, he will solve it, but anyway, uh, for now it is still open. Uh, okay, um, yeah, as I was saying in our counter example, two distinct Floquet eigenvalue trace the same band in opposite direction. So if you only care about one eigenvalue function, maybe it does behave well uh, in general, we, we don't know. So maybe AC spectrum is, is sufficient. And uh, this is an explanation of what I was saying. Uh, I must also say that you see uh, in this assumption, uh, if the bands are already disjoint, then ES will never meet EW for, w, for S distinct than W. Okay, so if, if all bands are disjoint, you only care what happened for ES. You don't care ES and EW. And you can, all, you can always decouple the bands by putting uh, a potential which, is, which has a, a, the distinct values, okay, large enough, okay? So you want, if you put QV and QW, they are all far apart from one another, then the bands are all decoupled. And now you can just study one eigenfunction, okay? Okay, uh, in the remaining, let me uh, give you more results. So uh, suppose now I take any graph gamma, which has new equal one, okay? So like ZD, for example. Now I take any finite graph GF and I put some potential on it, no problem. And I consider the Cartesian product of gamma with GF. Then in this case, this Cartesian product will be a periodic graph with fundamental cell, which is exactly the finite graph GF that you, you did. And the theorem is true. 
Okay, so we can set, we can check this assumption. Okay, so what I'm saying is that I, I took, I start from a graph which has fundamental uh, domain, just one vertex. And I take the Cartesian product with a finite graph. Then our theorem is satisfied and I'll, I'll, um, I'll show you what Cartesian product means. And moreover, not only is the theorem satisfied, we can also understand what happens with this mysterious factor here. So when, when discussing the main theorem, I told you it is nice when you look at the periodic block as a whole, but you don't really understand what happened within the block. But in case of Cartesian product, we do understand what happened. Okay, so it, more precisely in the special case where we take a tensor basis. Okay, so I, this is an eigenbasis for gamma and WJ is an eigenbasis for, for GF and you take the tensor basis. Then this reduces to some average weighted average. Okay, so A plus VQ is just uh, the weight, uh, the weighted, uh, the, the average of A over, so let me give you an example here. Uh, sorry. Okay. So a, for example, A plus V1 will be the average of A plus V1 is the average of A over the line here. And the average of A plus V2 is, is its average over the lower line. Okay. So you fix the V and take the average in one direction. Okay. And so on. So in this case, uh, what I was telling you is that uh, this mysterious factor here becomes a certain combination of the average over each line. And unfortunately, this combination depends on the eigenbasis. You see, it depends on WG. So this is a very surprising thing. We, we, uh, uh, in, a, in a moment, I will tell you that uh, there, are, there were previous uh, results um, uh, on trees, okay, but in the, we never saw it. So it is somehow natural to, to, to expect that the, the psi will not be uniformly distributed, that somehow it will have a periodic behavior. But what is surprising is that what happens within each cell can depend on the basis. Okay, so for each basis, you have a different, uh, a different behavior within the cells. That's, that's a bit uh, strange. So I will give you an example. So uh, first, uh, what what does Cartesian product look like? So uh, let me give you one uh, one example here. This is the Cartesian product of Z with a four cycle. So as you can see, it it looks like this. You take your four cycle and make infinite infinitely many copies of it. Okay, so you replace each vertex of Z with a copy of of the cycle, and then you, you connect the matching vertices. Okay, so this is connected to this one. And so, okay, so this is a general thing. If you take the Cartesian product of Z with any finite graph GF, it will look like this, infinitely many copies of GF, and you just link the, the matching vertices. Okay, so you see it gives you a very rich family. And that is just that I told you that the theorem is valid for any graph with new equal one. So it is valid for any uh, of this graph here. If I take the Cartesian product of any of this graph with a finite graph, it is valid. Okay, now le let me go back to the cylinder. On this cylinder, we can find two, two orthonormal bases such that this factor here is, uh, for one basis, it is a uniform average. So what happens within the cell is very good, but for a different basis, it is not. Well, actually, for the for the other basis, it is it lives on half on half the cycle. Okay, so it is uh, for example half half zero zero. Okay, so you see that the weight distribution within the cells, unfortunately, in general, will depend on the basis, and there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, here, uh, uh, in case of uh, Z with uh, so it's just one per one dimensional periodic potential. Just for curiosity, I computed uh, this mysterious factor and I took, uh, if I take just two values of the potential, Q black and Q circle, and I take them in the limit uh, when the potential become very large. Okay, so this is just Z with two values, but the values of the potential are far apart. Then in this case, this weighted average becomes the average of a over the end over the the even number multiplied by the psi so the, the mass of psi over the even number plus the average of a 
over the odd numbers multiplied by this one. Okay, so you, you can see it, it seemed to depend on psi, not just on the on the norm of psi. Okay. Even for uh, for one dimension with two potential. Okay, you can maybe we can skip this. Okay. I, yeah, so uh, of course I, I should say that uh, this is uh, certainly not the, the first result of quantum ergodicity. So the, the first result which started the whole story is uh, a result by Nalini, Alan Taraman, and Etienne Le Masson. So in this uh, theorem, the infinite graph uh, gamma was the, the regular tree. Okay, so for us, uh, we have uh, ZD, uh, per, this kind of graph, so period, ZD periodic graph. It, Originally, the, the first theorem was when, when the infinite graph was uh, the regular tree for the adjacency matrix. And uh, in case of the regular tree, you do not approximate it by finite subset as we did here. Uh, this is a very bad approximation. It doesn't work. So you approximate it using uh, regular graphs. Okay. So uh, more precisely, uh, the assumption was that uh, you have an infinite sequence of graphs which are regular expanders. And they converge in some sense to the regular tree. So the convergence here just means that you do not have a lot of cycle. The, the fraction of cycles in, is negligible. Then in this case, uh, you know that you have quantum ergodicity. So most eigenfunctions are somehow uniformly distributed. And we managed to generalize the theorem with Nalini uh, a few years later. So we no longer re require the graphs to be regular. Okay, uh, the tree can be non-regular, and we also allowed to to add a potential. Uh, so our theorem is a was the following: If I have somehow a sequence of graphs which converge to this tree, which may not be regular in some sense, and if the limiting Schrödinger operator has absolutely continuous spectrum, then we had quantum ergodicity for the sequence of approximating graphs. So in particular, uh, the theorem applied to universal cover under perturbation, which is an Anderson model in weak disorder. So le let me just give you a picture. So this is the universal cover of this graph here. So as you can see, it is not, it is not regular, okay? But it is almost regular. I mean, it is periodic somehow, okay? So all green vertices, uh, are equivalent or red vertices. And you can add a periodic potential. So if I add four values of the potential here, then all blue vertices here will be endowed the same potential and so on. Okay, so for this kind of periodic operator, we have quantum ergodicity, but not just for periodic operator, also for random operator. Okay, so we, we can also consider Anderson. So this, these were earlier results. As you can see, the infinite graph was a tree. And um, in these results, we actually could say more. So we could study not only the modulus of psi square, but also the correlation, psi of x, psi of one. And this was universal somehow. So for example, for the adjacency matrix on TQ, you can show that this correlation behaves like the spherical function. So the spherical function of the tree, if you don't know it, it's a certain combination of Sebichev polynomial divided by the volume of the graph. Okay, so it, it is more general than saying that psi square is approximately one over the volume. Here you, you study when x and y are different. But as you, the important part here is that it's universal. Okay, the, this function here did not depend on psi. Okay, so in, in our framework, this is not true. So already you see that within the cell, the, the, the mass distribution of psi square within the cell is not universal. And also the correlation is not universal either, even for ZD. So for ZD, you just, you, your fundamental cell is just one vertex, okay? But this correlation is no longer universal. Okay, so these are quite uh, in sharp contrast with, uh, with trees. Okay, I don't know if I have time or maybe. Okay, I, how much time do I have? About two minutes. Okay. Okay, let, let me give you just very quickly uh, an idea how, how this uh, mysterious assumption, Fluke assumption here, where does it come from? Okay, I think uh, this will be good. And you, uh, um, I think it's necessary. I, I don't see, I really don't see how it can be avoided. Okay, so how do we prove the theorem? 
you remember here, so let, let me just go back to the statement. We, we want to understand this average of A over Psi, Psi square and compare uh, and try to show that it is somehow uniform in the series. So let us work on this. Okay, so I have my observable Psi A Psi. Using just the fact that Psi is an, eigen, is an eigenfunction, I can see that this is equal to this. Okay, right, because uh, e power minus, so here you, this is an eigenfunction, okay, so e power, th this one will cancel the other one, and it is true for any time t, so it is also true uh, for the mean. Okay, so you have really an equality for all times. And uh, so now you want to understand uh, this sandwich here. So in the spirit of Egorov theorem, so th this idea is, uh, is uh, so somehow it is similar to what was done before. In, in this period, you want to, to write this average uh, as a kind of quantization of some symbol FT. Okay, this is how it was done on manifolds. Uh, and try to understand the large behavior. So in some sense, you want to, uh, now this, this creature here, which appears, you want to, to write it as some kind of uh, quantization of a certain symbol FT. Uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, study what happened what happened when t grows large. Okay, so for the adjacent symmetrics on ZD, just to give you an idea what is quantization here. If you had the adjacent symmetrics on ZD, then uh, if we write psi uh, as uh, the Fourier series, so for uh, just for uh, uh, on the periodic block of size n. Then a reasonable quantization, I think, would be to, to take a variation of this Fourier series. So uh, up the F, the Psi of N, will be uh, this, this creature. Okay, so it satisfies uh, some, some nice things. For example, if F does not depend on L, then it is a multiplication operator. If F does not depend on N, then it is just a, a function of the operator. So it is uh, similar to the classical properties of quantization. Okay. So if, if you only care about the adjacent symmetrics on ZD, then this seems like a reasonable quantization. Uh, for periodic graph, the, the Floquet variant of this, so you do not have Floquet, Fourier series, instead you work with Floquet series somehow, and it's a bit more complicated, but somehow manage it. Good, so you can do this, okay? You can write this as some kind of, uh, of uh, operator uh, FT. Now this operator FT, as you can see, you, you evolve in one direction and then you evolve in the other, in the opposite direction. Okay, so because of it, uh, very quickly, because I, I must uh, finish, this, this integral here appears. Okay, so as you can see one over T, the integral, this is here, but you have this difference of eigenvalues here. Right, because you evolve in opposite direction, and uh, you have a shift because of. Uh, so you you see that for any fixed n, this will vanish unless the exponent is zero. Okay, so if the exponent is zero, then this is one, and you have a problem. But if the if the exponent is non-zero, this will vanish. So the only terms that survive as t goes to infinity are these ones, and this is somehow why uh, the assumption appears. Okay, so I, I think I'll stop here. And if uh, if there are any questions, I, I can explain more. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mustafa, for the uh, for the very nice uh, talk. We have some time for questions now. So if you have any questions, either just uh, unmute yourself or ask them in chat, please. So I, I'll start with one. It's, it's um, so I was wondering the, the, this this uh, Floquet theory. Um, I know I. I'm I, I'm more knowledgeable about the continuum version of, of this Floquet theory than this uh, graph version, but um, one would like to extend it to to other group actions than just translation. Maybe things that have torsion as well. Uh, in this case, can you can you generalize this to something else than ZD as your uh, group action, or, or or do you really use the fact that? Uh, this is free. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, um, I mean, the, 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 the kind of things that look like what we did is, uh, I mean, the, the, the most immediate uh, analogy would be in the, in the Euclidean case. So you work on RD, just uh, the standard Laplacian with, uh, with a periodic potential on RD. 
So I think that most most of the proof will go on, no, no problem. But you, you will still have a, a similar assumption on the Floquet eigenvalue, and it may be more complicated because you have infinitely many eigenvalue in this case. But other families that that are also amenable to this kind of Floquet decomposition are uh, what people call um, abelian covering. Okay, so you have a yeah, a compact manifold, for example, and instead of studying the universal cover, uh, like which correspond to this universal cover of which is a tree here, you, you study what people call a maximal abelian covering. So in this case, you also have a floquet decomposition. You can show, I think some Japanese guys uh, showed that uh, you have uh, absolutely continuous spectrum, maybe with some eigenvalues, but mm -hmm. I think that's all we know. So. So maybe uh, this this kind of analysis translate here, but somehow I think uh, th this kind of assumption on how the eigenvalue behave as a transition band will always appear. Mm -hmm. And I think it's necessary somehow because in all our proof, we, we just have one inequality. <laughs> so, uh, and I think it's very hard to, to get rid of this inequality. So somehow it seems necessary to... Mm -hmm. I mean, somehow that's exactly what I wanted to know. The, so, so do, do you have a reference for this abelian cover uh, uh, result? I mean, or maybe you can send it to me after. Uh... Uh, abelian cover? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I can send you. So it is a paper uh, by some uh, Japanese guys. I, I have the, I will. Uh, I will yeah, and in chat, uh, Chris Judge says that there's a nice survey by uh, Sunada for the abelian coverings uh, in this case. So I guess. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, do we have other questions for uh, Mustafa today? Uh, so you were saying that, so you're taking um, boxes uh, with PRD conditions. Uh, is there a very, if, is there a good reason to feel like this is the nice way to take subsets? Because it's not the case for re regular graphs, like you were saying. Yeah, so here, uh, here uh, actually, um, for regular, uh, in case of, if you want to approximate the tree, there is, uh, you can see that taking just the balls uh, will not work because, uh, it is not a good approximation. I mean, um, you, you see on the boundary of the ball, you do not have the correct degree because you have degree just one. Okay, and the, the problem on trees is that this boundary, so these problematic points are most of the ball. Okay, so the, the mass of the boundary is, is, is approximately half the mass of the whole ball. Right, so uh, the, there is a good reason why it's, it's not possible uh, to just take balls in the tree. Uh, in case of ZD, I do, uh, so we take periodic conditions. Uh, it, so it's natural in case of ZD just to take boxes. In, in terms of Benjamini sharp conversions, these boxes will converge to, to ZD. So it's um, with the periodic potential. So it's the good notion of conversions, but does it uh, depend on periodic conditions or uh, Dirichlet condition and so on? Uh, I don't think it does, but uh, somehow this uh, seemed uh, the natural condition for us. Uh, I don't think it depends on boundary condition. Thank you, uh, thank you, Laura, for the question. Uh, I guess, I mean, again, if, it, if it's similar to the Euclidean case, it, it should not depend on boundary conditions as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have other questions? Uh... Yeah, I had a question. Hi, I'm Stefan. Yes, yes, uh, 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 Stefan. Uh, <clears throat> so I have a question about the, the simple, simple lattice. Uh, somewhat the lattice uh, and just the, the let's say the without any potential. I mean, it looks mm -hmm. like it's a discretization of the of the torus. I mean, when you put boundary conditions, it's it's like a discretized uh, Laplacian on the torus with with various uh, boundary conditions. So you know, there were old results by Borgia and by Dima Jacobson on on eigenfunctions on the Laplacian on the torus and. Uh, what they found is that they, it depends on the dimension and somewhat the regularity depends on the on the dimension of the torus. So the, the higher the dimension, the more singular the eigenfunctions could be, or, or semi-classical measures somewhat, no, not the eigenfunctions themselves, but the semi-classical measures. So, okay, so quantum limit, yeah, sorry, like quantum quantum limit. yes, the yeah, quantum, quantum unique. unique. Okay, okay. So I mean, so which is due to the fact that you have higher higher degeneracies, I guess, when you're on high dimension. So, and it seems that you criter Okay, so did you did you try to to see these, uh, okay, these more singular uh, quantum limits in the in the uh, on the to on the on this uh, lattice lattice uh, operators, it's just uh, it's just uh, uh, it's just uh, adjacent symmetrics uh, on ZD, you know, or ZD over N, N ZD if you want. Okay, so you just periodize. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, 
It depends what you mean by quantum unique ergodicity here, because uh, because here you see for for each uh, for for each cube uh, you have a, a new set of eigenfunctions, right? So, so for, yes. you mean the, your, and uh, if you if you take it literally, then uh, uh, then eigenfunction like this one will will somehow co contradict quantum ergodicity, uh, quantum unique ergodicity. Okay, ju just uh, and mm -hmm. you can you can do this also in two dimension. So I, I have an example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think uh, on on the D maybe you need to first uh, to to relax a bit what you mean by quantum unique ergodicity if you really want to look at okay. specific. Like, if you if you take it literally, it will not work. Yes, okay, that's right. I mean, uh, okay, okay. The work it was not about quantum ergodicity, but it was about yes, all, all the types of all the types of quantum limits you can get. Yes, that's right. It's a different question. Okay. Uh, okay. But so, so here, I mean, this question is just this this uh, this example here, this psi knot which you're showing here, it's mm -hmm. just a, it's just a linear linear combination of two two plane waves somewhat or two two uh, uh, two two eigenstates of the type of omega omega squared etc. Which we showed before. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. yeah. You just need a very you need a small small degeneracies to to have this type of uh, of behavior and right? with, with vanishing vanishing. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 and th th this is on Z. Maybe on ZD it gets uh, more complicated. Yeah, so may maybe it gets worse. I don't know. Okay, and the con so the, the condition you have this condition you you showed. Uh, I mean, uh, about yeah. degeneracies. So it it's a it's a yes, it's a condition about the, the size of degeneracies in some sense. I mean, how degenerate, how many degenerate eigenvalues do I have, or how degenerate are they? Okay, that's. Uh, okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so I was mentioning that. Uh, when Sai Liu is uh, maybe working on this, and it seems it may be related to what they call irreducibility of uh, Fermi variety and uh, Bloch variety. It seems related uh, to this problem, uh, but we, we are not uh, completely sure yet. Uh, he is working on it. I, I don't know anything about uh, this irreducibility theory. So, okay, <clears throat> okay, but somewhat, I mean. On these graphs, I mean, you could try to use the, this, uh, this tensor products and make some assumptions about the the, the size of um, multiplicities to try just to decompose eigenstates into tensor products and see what this uh, what these linear combinations could look like. No, I mean, so uh, I understand this is not the way you proceed in your proof, but uh, uh, you know, what what do you mean? Uh, and somewhat, so I mean, this this constraint you want to constrain the the, the amount of degeneracies of spectral degeneracies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And once so you have a constraint on this, you try to expand, just expand eigenfunctions. Uh, each eigenfunction can be expanded into into uh, block waves if you want. Okay, block uh, eigenstates. And well, if the degeneracies are not too large, then the, uh, somewhat the, the, you don't have so many terms. You won't have too many terms uh, to in each uh, for each eigenstate. There will be uh, each eigenstate will be a combination of relatively few uh, block waves. In some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan, I think that what you are saying. Yes. Essentially, that there is a longitudinal degree of freedom, and there is transversal degree of freedom, and they are yes. independent. So, yes. what you are suggesting, correct? If I am correct, then you are to first of all to diagonalize and use the representation where the transversal degrees of freedom. Yes, but are, that's what he was doing in some sense. But exactly, right. and then what happens is that on each, then you have different modes, and each mode has a different propagation. A vector, it, it's energy minus the excitation energy, mm. and the, the, and then the 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 uh, the, um, yes, the, yes. the the uh, the the generosity that you are alluded to will be reflected in the fact that there are two two propagating modes with the same energy. I mean, uh, this yes, they are the they are the, the and that is where you see all these effects. It is this minus one plus one or zero zero, which will, he is showing there. If you look at it as a mode propagation, as, as a multi-mode uh, propagating channel, like a, like like a pipe, then you have the vertical, the transversal degrees of freedom, and then there is the longitudinal. And if you if you look at the diagonal diagonalized basis, then you have modes which uh, propagate as a one-dimensional problem. But the, the only difference is that the energy by which they are propagating is the total energy minus the excitation which you take into the perpendicular mode. But here the excitation are the same. I mean, that's the condition. This ES minus EW is equal to zero, isn't it? Isn't no, the, it? the condition is that there is, the, there, there is the scalar product, that the, the, the Hamiltonian is the, uh, separable. 
in one degree in one uh, approximate in the in the in the uh, basis which is propagating versus some other basis in a transversal mode that, uh, that uh, I don't know. So when you say to take a tensor uh, basis, so in the you, you here you are just talking about the adjacency matrix, not uh, not with a potential. Well, I'm I'm my my idea is coming from um, actually from mm -hmm. a two dimensional uh, or higher dimensional uh, continuum where you have one direction of propagation or several if you wish, but let's take one propagation area the direction. And the other one is the perpendicular direction. Like a pu if you take a, pu a, a tube, a pipe, mm -hmm. or a, a cable, like this cable, which I have now, you see my cable? Yes, it has yes. a propagating direction and has mm -hmm. a transversal direction. Yes. And the propagating mm -hmm. one is gives, give, gives you the continuum and the transversal gives you the modes of excitation. Okay. And if you work in the eigenfunctions of the transversal, then you have single modes. Each mode propagates with a different velocity. And that's, I think, what happens here because it is a, what you have here, a discrete version of a multi-mode problem. Okay. But this is a physicist way of, of looking at it. It's not, <laughs> but you can translate it to mathematics. But yeah, this block theory, okay, so, okay. Possibly. It is block theory said in a slightly different way, yes. And what you introduced correctly is the importance and it is a good, good, good uh, remark that the importance of having a degenerate spectrum in the transverse mode and the importance of it to various other things which you can measure. Thanks a lot. Uh...